Can I welcome everyone to the 21st meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2017? Can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting? I've received apologies from Tavish Scott for this morning. Agenda item one, there's a declaration of interest from uh, Oliver Mundell to the committee, and can I welcome Oliver and uh, give him the opportunity now to declare any relevant interest? Thank you, Convener. I'm delighted to be joining the committee, and I can confirm that I've got no relevant interest to declare. Thank you very much. Uh, agenda item two is a decision on whether to take items of business in private. Firstly, is everyone content that item five of this meeting be taken in private? Thank you. Secondly, do members agree to consider any future discussions of evidence on the Children and Young People Information Scotland Bill in private? Uh, can, you, can I just ask a question there? Yes. About the specific nature of that, because uh, it's not clear as to whether you mean uh, all evidence. Uh, it's discussions of evidence. The discussions of evidence, yes, right. OK. okay. Thank you. Right, uh, agenda item three, subordinate legislation. Uh, two statutory instruments in front of us which are listed in the agenda. We considered these instruments in June and agreed to write to the Scottish Government. A response was received over the summer and the relevant extract of that response is included in members' papers. We also agreed that once we received the response, we would decide whether to hear more from government officials on these instruments. No member has asked that officials attend today. Do members have any additional comments on either of these instruments? In that case, we'll move on to the next item of business, which is a briefing from Scottish Government officials on the Children and Young People Information Scotland Bill. And I welcome to the meeting Ellen Burt, Team Leader, Bill Team Leader, and John Patterson, Divisional Solicitor at Scottish Government. Welcome. This is our first session on the bill, and so can I invite officials to brief the committee on the detail of the bill itself, its financial implications, and its delegated powers? Yes, I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Um, my intention this morning is to provide a bit of background to the bill which is before the committee and an explanation of what its provisions do um, and I'll also address the financial memorandum and delegated powers within the bill as you've just said. Um, the Children and Young People Act 2014 provides the statutory underpinning for the Getting It Right for Every Child approach, which is our national approach in Scotland to improving outcomes and supporting the well-being of children and young people by offering the right help at the right time from the right people. The Named Person Service and the Child's Plan are central to the Getting It Right for Every Child approach, putting the well-being of every child and young person at the centre and ensuring that services work together to support children and young people and their families. The policy was developed in response to real life experiences and expert advice that a timely and early offer of advice and help can prevent troubles from becoming crises. It was developed in response to the ask from parents for a clear point of contact for, for children, young people and parents themselves should they wish to seek support, information or advice. The Scottish Government is committed to ensuring that all children and young people, irrespective of where they live in Scotland, um, um, and, and it remains committed to the provision of a universal named person service for all children and young people up to the age of 18. And it's against this backdrop that the 2014 Act was passed. The 2014 Act, as you know, was challenged in the case of the Christian Institute and others against the Lord Advocate as being outside the legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament. The grounds of that challenge were that part four of the Act, which related to the name person service, related to reserved matters, that it was incompatible with the European Convention on Human Rights and that it was incompatible with EU law. The Supreme Court gave its decision in July 2016. The Supreme Court dismissed the challenges in relation to reserved matters and EU law. On the human rights challenge, the Supreme Court found that the provision of a named person service was unquestionably legitimate and benign. It went on to find, however, that the information sharing provisions in Part 4 were not in accordance with the law. And in brief, this was because of the very serious difficulties in accessing the relevant legal rules and the lack of safeguards which would enable the proportionality of an interference with Article 8 rights to be examined. So what has happened since the Supreme Court case? <clears throat> 
The Scottish Government held an intense period of extensive engagement between September and December 2016. This involved over 50 meetings with some 250 organisations and groups that were involved. We heard from around 700 young people, parents and carers, practitioners, professionals and leaders from education, health, local authorities, the police, faith communities, unions and charities. And through this engagement, we also listened to those who had raised concerns about the name person policy, including Care Scotland, Clan Child Law, Together and the Scottish Parent Teacher Council, amongst others. This bill seeks to address the points raised by the Supreme Court and ensure that decisions around the sharing of information are taken in partnership with children and young people and their parents. This is something that children and young people, parents and practitioners expressed as a key issue for them and core to the getting it right for every child approach. The bill makes changes to parts four and five of the act. Those are the parts in relation to the named uh, person service and the child's plan. And the bill makes changes in relation to information sharing only. It seeks to clarify the provisions around information sharing and ensure that proper safeguards are in place. In relation to part four of the Act, in relation to the name person service, the bill substitutes a new section 26 and inserts a new section 26A. These relate to the provision of information by or to a named person service provider. The previous duty to share information under the 2014 Act is removed and placed with a new duty to consider sharing information. Firstly, the named person or other information holder seeking to share information with the named person service provider must consider whether providing the information could, in its opinion, promote, support or safeguard the well-being of the child. Secondly, they must consider whether the relevant information could be shared in accordance with the law, and that includes data protection law, human rights law, and the law of confidentiality. The third thing which the bill requires, or the, the, the bill does, is provide a power to share information. This means that there is no longer a duty to share information, but that named persons and others seeking to share information with the named person can continue to exercise their professional discretion. Section 1 of the bill amends Section 23 of the 2014 Act, which is in relation to communication in relation to the movement of children and young people. It makes similar changes to ensure that information may be shared where information could promote, support or safeguard the well-being of a child or young person. And it contains similar provision, making it clear that information can only be shared where this is in accordance with the law, which includes data protection law, human rights law and the law of confidentiality. The new section 26A makes it clear that information cannot be shared under part 4 unless the Data Protection Act and other relevant law can be complied with. And it also ensures that information cannot be shared where this would prejudice the conduct of criminal investigation or the prosecution of an offence. With regard to delegated powers, the bill introduces a new section 26B, placing a duty on ministers to issue a code of practice about the provision of information under part four, so by or with the named, surface, uh, uh, named person service providers. The bill provides for this code to be binding and that it must provide for safeguards applicable to the sharing of information. And the bill sets out the procedure that must be followed before issuing a code of practice, which is akin to an affirmative procedure, placing obligations on ministers to consult relevant persons, to lay a draft before the Parliament for 40 days, and to take account of any views expressed by the Parliament. Whilst the Supreme Court focused on part four of the Act in relation to the named person service, the bill makes similar changes to the information sharing provisions in part five of the 2014 Act, which is in relation to the children's plans, eh, the child's plan. In particular, it brings these provisions into alignment with the new provisions in information sharing under part four, making clear that information can only be shared where this is in compliance with the law and where it would not prejudice the conduct of a criminal investigation or prosecution of an offence. <laughs> 
The new Section 40B of the Bill places a duty on ministers to issue a code of practice in relation to the sharing of information under Part 5 in the same way that Section 26B does in respect of the name person's service. As you'll be aware, the committee has also been provided with an illustrative draft code of practice. This is intended to assist the committee in understanding how the power to issue a code of practice could be used. It is intended to be an illustration only and shows how a code of practice could provide for additional safeguards in relation to information sharing. As it is an illustration, it was drafted with regard to the laws it presently applies. The illustrative code is set out in two parts, firstly in relation to safeguards and secondly it provides a description of the relevant law and these were both things that the Supreme Court um, focused on. The code sets out the steps which the named person service provider or relevant authority seeking to share information with a named person must follow in order for the information sharing to be in compliance with the law. It sets out the responsibilities to inform the person to whom the information relates and the need to seek consent, which will be applicable in most circumstances. Practically, this is likely to require the consent of the child, young person or their parents. It sets out the responsibilities which apply in the limited circumstances where the law permits consent not to be required, including steps to inform the persons affected before or after sharing. Importantly, the code does not change the law on data sharing or human rights, but sets out the safeguards which must be followed to ensure that information sharing is in compliance with the law. And it also uh, contains uh, requirements to record decisions, which is an important part of good decision making. The second part of the code, as I said, provides a description of the relevant law. And again, this is because of the importance that the Supreme Court placed on this matter in its decision. As I said, the draft which has been published is for illustrative purposes only, and any code will require to be subject to consultation and the procedure set out in the bill before you. Before taking questions, I'll address the financial memorandum. The Scottish Government has supported local implementation of the Getting It Right for Every Child approach by providing £10.2 million to local authorities to prepare, to prepare for the commencement of Parts 4 and 5 of the Act. Prior to the planned implementation date in August 2016, local authorities, health boards, Police Scotland and other organisations had confirmed that they were ready and prepared to be compliant with these parts of the 2014 Act on commencement. The financial memorandum sets out the additional costs of 1.2 million, which will be required to develop training and learning materials to support national consistency and the backfill of staff undergoing training on the new duties on information sharing only, which are set out in the bill. The financial memorandum is based on the same modelling which was agreed with stakeholders and the Parliament during the passage of the 2014 Act. The expectation is that this training will complement and become part of the regular supervision and CPD requirements that professionals undertaking the named person role and child plans responsibilities already undertake. This will be supported by revised statutory guidance under the 2014 Act and information and practice materials which the Getting It Right for Every Child policy team will be developing in collaboration with children, young people and practitioners in advance of implementation. I hope that summary has been of assistance to the committee and myself and my colleague are happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to start off, I, I may have a couple of questions later on, but I'm going to start off by asking Liz Smith if she would like to. Uh, thank you, Convener, and thank you for your uh, information provided there. Um, when we debated the uh, Child, Children, Young People's Bill um, several years ago, one of the concerns that was expressed by witnesses at the time, specifically uh, people like the Faculty of Advocates, Child, uh, Clan Child Law, and Professor Norrie, who gave uh, a legal interpretation of some aspects on um, to, to assist the committee. The concerns that they raised then was that there had not been sufficient consultation on the implications of data sharing and some of the legal interpretations uh, of specific terms, which I'll come to in a minute. Could you tell us uh, what consultations have taken place 
um, in preparation for this new bill about uh, these specific issues, uh, could I first of all ask uh, what consultations have taken place with the Office of the Information Commissioner? Um, uh, yes. Um, uh, we have, as officials, been engaging very closely with the Information Commissioner. Um, as I said, um, there was an intensive three-month period of engagement on the back of the Supreme Court decision, which um, was intended to look really critically at what the issues um, that that decision had raised and how best we move forward to ensure that the objective of a named person service could be fulfilled, because we know that practitioners and parents of families have told us that when the getting it right for every child approach is working that it is of support to them. Um, most recently um, uh, when that um, period of intensive engagement closed um, we've continued to work through our um, close stakeholder groups. We have both a national implementation um, group and a GERFEC lead officers group which we meet with um, to do, and we have discussed this the sort of intricacies of the plans that um, the government were intending to put forward. And then just recently, in the last um, couple of weeks, we have as officials sat down again with the Information Commissioner's Office, in particular recognising that the General Data Protection Regulation is obviously on the horizon. Um, and uh, you know the, the the bill and the illustrative draft code of practice that is uh, in front of you have both been drafted in order to be cognizant of that. Um, the the way that the bill is set out um, allows us um, to be responsive to that that changing landscape and ensure that um, where additional safeguards and explanation are required once um, the position of the UK government is clear on the general data protection uh, regulation, um, that we will be able to do that through the procedure that I set out for you on the um, Code of Practice. Uh, th thank you for that. Uh, could I ask uh, very specifically, uh, on a technical level, are, are you confident that the advice that you are providing to ministers about uh, the legal definitions within the new bill and those that have been the advice that have been provided by the information commissioner, are you confident that that legal advice, the legal interpretation is clear? I can perhaps defer to my legal colleague here. Um, yes, is the answer. Um, just picking up on the um, answer that uh, Ellen gave a moment ago, um, in addition to the consultation that's already taken place, prior to the Code of Practice being published in draft, there is a, there is a proposed requirement for Scottish Ministers to be required to consult, and I would envisage that, that consultation would include uh, relevant bodies such as the Information Commissioner's Office. office. Um, the, uh, Code of practice is a requirement under the um, under the bill as proposed, rather than being something which is um, a, you know, rather than being a power for ministers to issue a code. There is a requirement to issue a code, so that so that code and the consultation that would take place prior to it being issued is something which which forms part of the of the scheme that's being proposed under the Act. Just on two uh, technical uh, points, uh, could I ask you about a point that's been raised um, by the Faculty of Advocates, um, which relates to this law of confidentiality, and they say that that's uh, derived from common law, and it's their understanding that the Scottish Government's interpretation of that is common law, um, but it says that it is not clear to what this section refers. Could you help us out there? Well, the um, law of confidentiality, in, uh, the, as from the Scottish Government's uh, perspective, is um, a common law um, which applies in relation to the provision of information which has a quality of confidentiality um, and you know, reference to um, various legal texts will um, illustrate that that um, duty exists. Um, I think in the um, faculty's submission, uh, they said that, that the duty exists only in relation to certain people in certain circumstances, and I think that, that's correct. Um, they, um, they refer to two circumstances, think um, doctors and lawyers, but um, the Scottish Government's position is that that duty extends 
more widely than simply to doctors and lawyers. And as I understand from the Law Society's um, submission, they recognise that there is a, a, a duty of a law, what one might describe as a law of confidentiality. Um, that's helpful up to a point. I, I think what, what the question I have is that they're asking to what section of the new bill does this refer? Now, taking on board um, what Ms Burt has said, the, the new bill, if it's to work well, has to have an understanding amongst named persons and people who are uh, going to implement the law that the change of they have to make a decision about when to share relevant information. That's that's the change. And if they're not clear about specific definitions, uh, would you agree that perhaps the advice should be to the government to tighten that up? If I can maybe be of assistance there, I think it's important to highlight that the, the bill that's in front of the committee is not changing the law on confidentiality or data sharing or human rights law. These are um, laws which public authorities right across Scotland you know, all, already have to comply with and already grapple with in terms of issues of data sharing. What the bill has clarified on the back of the Supreme Court decision is around the interaction between um, what the amended 2014 Act will be and, yeah. and the law as it stands. I, I totally accept that. But sorry to just to labour this point, but that's not what the Faculty of Advocates is saying. They're saying that they're not clear um, to which section this law of confidential section in the bill uh, this law of confidentiality refers. That, that's the point. Um, so the law of confidentiality applies generally, so it applies to all powers? To all of the bill. It applies to parts, our, so parts four and five. It, well, it applies to you know any um, any sharing of any information, and the question then is whether or not the information in question has the has the quality of of being confidential. So, for example, this exchange isn't confidential because it's taking place in public. On the other hand, an exchange that I have with um, a minister in relation to legal advice may well carry a, a, a quality of confidentiality. Um, and if I was a solicitor in private practice and I was providing legal advice, then it certainly would uh, provide, you know, carry that, com that quality. If you don't mind, can I just ask then, is the Faculty of Advocates looking for something here that, the, that normally wouldn't be required because the confidentiality, as you say, sort of holds across a whole piece? Um, my understanding of what, the, of what the Faculty of Advocates was saying was that they were saying that they recognise that there's a duty of confidentiality in certain circumstances, so for example between a doctor and patient, um, but they, didn't, they don't recognise that as being a broader um, law of confidentiality, if you like. Um, the Scottish Government's position is that there is a broader law of confidentiality um, of which that duty, uh, as between doctor and patient, forms and part. And that's supported by the Law Society. And that's supported by the Law Society. Okay. If, forgive me, I think this comes back to the nub of the issue. I mean, in, in the last bill, there was controversy, irrespective of what people's views on named persons are, this is not to do with that debate. This is to do with about the accuracy and the clarity of the law and specifically the bill. That, that's what's going to matter. And there are a number of submissions that we've received from people who are actually very supportive of the policy, but their concern is that they don't have clarity over specific legal meaning, which is what we didn't have last time, and which I would argue raised to a lot of concerns about inaccurate scrutiny of the bill, and I suspect that's one of the reasons why uh, we ended up with such a difficult uh, issue. No, it's a, it's a technical, yeah, 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 it's a technical yeah, yeah, yeah. point. And, and what I'm asking is whether we have that understanding and clarity now about these specific legal uh, issues. And can I just finish on the point, do you, is it your understanding that on the issue of well-being, which is currently defined by the Shinari indices, has there been any discussion on a technical level about whether that is an adequate definition of well-being, given that that was a concern raised by the Supreme Court? If, if I can perhaps deal with your uh, first um, point, just wrapping up the discussion we were having. I, I think when you were asking about um, the, what the Faculty of Advocates are saying about you know, where, which, which provision, which section within the Bill or the 2014 Act of the Law of Confidentiality apply to, the, 
what the bill is doing is simplifying that relationship between what will be an amended 2014 Act and the law. So the, one of the, the, um, the concerns that the Supreme Court raised was how a duty to share information, so a duty that didn't carry any professional discretion, sat alongside uh, the requirements of data protection law human rights law and the law of confidentiality. What the, what the bill is before the uh, committee now is doing is removing that, um, that tension. It, there is no longer a requirement to share information. It is, it is creating a, 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 a legal prompt for named person service providers and others seeking to share information with them to consider whether sharing that information would support, promote or um, um, uh, protect the uh, well-being needs of a child and then giving them the power to do so. So the law of confidentiality and the law of data protection and human rights will apply to all of that uh, decision-making process. In relation to your point about the uh, definition of well-being, um, it, it's uh, again um, Im important to recognise that the uh, that, that what the, the 2014 Act is doing is setting up a, a name person service which is about providing help to children and young people and their families when they need it to prevent low level issues as we know escalating and turning into bigger problems. Um, by its very nature, um, the well-being needs of children will be as different as you know the number of children and that the, you know, uh, this is a, a concept which again has been um, well utilised and well understood amongst practitioners, families and children that are using it now and the 2014 Act for the first time puts those wellbeing indicators on a legislative footing. Um, again it's important to um, read those indicators with reference to the you know wider statutory guidance and um, practice materials that have and and will be redeveloped in relation to this new bill. Um, but the position of, of the government is is that that well being you know unlike um, welfare concerns it's not a threshold that that children have mm, to meet. Indeed. <laughs> okay. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Colin? Thank you. Just a, a couple of questions, really. Um, SPSO, they consider there was quite an overlap. Has that been taken into account? Is that going to be uh, adjusted? A an overlap in what respect? Sorry. Uh, uh, an overlap, I'm just quoting from the papers I've got here, between this pro pro the, pro the complaints process and the existing jurisdiction for complaints, and they suggest the bill is amended to remove this duplication. Yes, I'm, I'm familiar with the, the submission that they've made. Thank you for that clarification. Um, the, the, the bill that's uh, before the committee is in relation to the information sharing provisions um, uh, within section uh, parts four and five of the Act. Um, there is um, obviously a complaints procedure which is set out within the 2014 Act and which was agreed upon and passed by the Parliament. Um, and my understanding is, my colleague, can correct me here that there um, is a requirement for um, secondary legislation in relation to that complaints procedure, um, which again will be developed ahead of implementation. So the Parliament again will have an opportunity to consider that um, before full implementation of parts four and five. And I guess the uh, second question I've got is there's, there seems to be an awful lot more detail laying down who's responsible for what this time round? Is 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 it, has it been found necessary to do that? Um, I think um, in developing the uh, proposal that the government has put forward, we have listened very carefully to uh, the concerns that were raised by the Supreme Court and also um, through the um, intensive engagement we had with families and practitioners and, um, you know, as, as we know from the Supreme Court judgment, that issue of clarity um, was um, extremely important. And so the bill and illustrative code seek to um, make it very clear the steps um, which a named person service provider or 
person seeking to share information with them has to go through in order to fulfil their responsibilities and be compliant with the law. So you feel as a result of the court judgment, it's been necessary to extend the uh, requirements as to who does what, for want of a better word? I'm, I'm not sure that the, 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 the bill extends the requirements of who does what, but um, we would certainly um, argue that the, the bill um, that is in front of the committee um, makes that clearer. And that's been our intention. Thank you very much. Uh, Daniel? So as, as you've set out, one of the principal changes here is that, that, we, the, that the bill moves from uh, a, a duty to, to share information to one where professionals must consider, and in that, that they're essentially making a judgment between the information uh, being shared where it will promote well-being balanced against um, relevant laws, particularly data protection. Can I just ask what consideration was given to what that will do to the role of professionals and in particular kind of uh, uh, in, in terms of the capacity and capability that those professionals have to make that judgment um, uh, in their work? I, you know, again, um, I would uh, point to the fact that these are professionals, you know, the 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 people that have these responsibilities are the teachers, you know, health workers that are already engaged with children and, and families. And um, the intention um, behind the name person service was that um, families and children and young people had a, a, a single point of contact that they were already familiar with. Um, and, and as I said before, you know, what, what the, the bill is requiring in terms of compliance with the law is um, compliance with the law that already applies. So that, you know, the, the duty to um, consider whether um, sharing the information could promote or support or safeguard the well-being needs of a child in the, the vast majority of circumstances, what the Data Protection Act would require is that you were doing that with the consent of the child or their family. So these will be, you know, these will be needs that will be, you know, that the, the, they will discuss with the family, that they, you know, any intervention or proposed move forward would be discussed with the family. So I accept that in the majority of cases, um, but obviously the, 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 where this comes becomes controversial is in, in the extremes. And, and you're right, we are talking about professionals, but these are professionals trained in either healthcare or education, not the law. So I'm just wondering, was any work carried out to, to look at kind of what capacity, both in terms of capacity, i.e. the ability to carry out the work, and capability, i.e. undertaking those judgments, was made in terms of what new implications this change will make? Well, you know, both during the passage of the 2014 Act and in relation to um, the current bill, we've engaged extensively um, with stakeholders from both education and health in relation to the impact that um, this approach would have on the workforce. And as I said before, we have a, a national implementation support group, which includes um, professionals from local authorities and health. Um, you, you know, we continue to engage very closely with um, both health boards and um, unions and representatives of the, of the teaching workforce. I think, you know, in relation to what you've talked about there about the difficult or the extreme cases, it's really important to underline that um, this bill and the 2014 Act don't in any way alter current child protection um, mechanisms. Mm -hmm. You know, that the, the law is clear on what professionals must do when there's a significant risk of harm. And again, um, you know, professionals working in an education setting or a healthcare setting will be familiar with that. Um, I think it's also important to highlight that, you know, the expectation is not that, um, you know, frontline workers, you know, are left on their own to scrutinise um, the legislation. We, you know, as we always do, will be working very closely with partners in health and education to make sure that effective and good quality and accessible 
um, training and development materials are available for frontline practitioners and importantly for families and children and young people themselves and that the you know that the responsibilities that are being placed on these in individuals um, you know training on that for will form part of their regular CPD and supervision okay. so, so part of the Supreme Court judgment explicitly stated that they remain concerned that it is exceptionally difficult it's exceptionally difficult requirement to impose on professionals in respect of every child and that furthermore that the the imposition risks making the, the professionals jobs considerably more difficult and undermining the trust of families now given that that was part of the Supreme Court judgment what as you see it, is in this amended legislation that, that mitigates those points raised by the Supreme Court? I think it's important that um, the Supreme Court were obviously considering the, the previous framework um, that was in place under the 14 Act, so the provisions that um, hadn't been commenced. Um, the Supreme Court were were considering the, the tension that arose between the duty which the 2014 Act placed on the named person service providers or persons sharing information with them to share information and the um, further um, requirements and responsibilities um, which were on them under the wider law, so human rights law, data protection law and the law of confidentiality. What the bill, what the new bill does is clarify that position by by making it clear that there is no duty to share information, that there is a duty to consider whether sharing information could benefit the well-being of a child, um, and and that there is a power to do so where that professional believes that it that it could um, be of benefit to well-being. But crucially, what the bill says is that that information can only be shared where doing so would be in compliance with the, the law as it stands. So, so my final point yeah, is that some of the concerns that have been raised is that that may well lead to defensive behaviour around the way that, that these judgments will be applied. Again, can I ask us what kind of consideration from a sort of behavioural standpoint uh, were made uh, when, when drafting this amended legislation? I think, um, you know, as the, the DFM has said in his previous statements to Parliament and to this committee, um, you know, it, it is the government's responsibility to ensure that we build trust and confidence within the named person service and child plans provisions. And as I've said before, you know, it's, it's our intention um, to work in conjunction with um, those professionals that will be delivering these responsibilities and with children and families in order to, to um, increase their understanding and to build that trust and confidence. And, and you know, the process that we're involved in right now in scrutinising um, this bill is part of that. Yeah, a very brief supplementary very from Joanne and then... Specific on. point on... Um, you said in the question of consent that it would be with the consent of the child or the family. And then you spoke about working with the family. Do you accept there's sometimes a conflict between the two and how would that be resolved? Um, yes. Um, and I, again, I think that's a conflict that arises now. Um, the, the, the illustrative code of practice that's in front of you um, sets out the... Um, the, the, the responsibilities that already apply in relation to um, capacity. Um, again, we, we would expect that um, you know, the professionals working with children and, and families would be looking to achieve the best outcome for them. Um, I think, you know, I can, I can perhaps defer to my colleague in terms of that very technical legal point about what happens if there, a, there is a... It's not it's whether it is possible to get the consent of a child to share information. Do you then have to speak with the family or not? And secondly, what evidence would you, a worker have to provide that they had considered the, the question of sharing information or not? They have a duty to consider it. How do you establish whether that duty has been... Um, carried through. I can perhaps ask my colleague to, to address the, the specific point about the law. Yeah, thank you. Um, the um, illustrative draft um, at uh, paragraph 5 um, makes reference to the position under the Data Protection Act, uh, which is that um, where a child is 12 years of age or more, uh, 
uh, they're presumed to be of sufficient age and maturity to have understanding in order to be able to give consent themselves. Um, so that, that would be the uh, starting point for any person who is considering whether or not uh, to seek the... So, so the, te but the technical point is whether a child under 12 gives information to somebody about what's happening to them in their own circumstances and that person feels that they should share that with other agencies, would they then have to go and seek the consent of the family about whom that... Um, the, 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 what the child is saying is about the family. And technically, if they're under 12, that, that, that they wouldn't be deemed to give consent. You would have to speak to the family about something the child has said about their own family. Um, in relation to somebody under 12, then they're deemed to... I presume to be a sufficient age and maturity in order to be able to give consent. That presumption um, can still, sorry, whilst that presumption won't exist, one can still conclude that a particular child under the age of 12 did have sufficient maturity and understanding in order to give consent. In the event that, for example, say we're talking about a child of five, where the person concludes that they don't have the um, have sufficient maturity and understanding, then the question would be whether um, the whether it was necessary to um, not seek consent because you, because the particular issue relates to, for example, the mother and father, um, and if the person concluded it was necessary not to seek consent in order to protect the interests of the child, then. The, the, that would be, it would be open to them to do that, and likelihood is they would be required to do that in order to fulfil their, their yes, duties. Pass, pass, but, but is it not the case, of course, that this happens just now? Exactly. Yes. So, the, 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 in terms of this bill, it's relevant that the, the same sort of safeguards and procedures would be in place to make sure that, that uh, the information that was required to protect somebody under 12 was in place. So it's not addressing the concerns that may, may be prompt some of the legislation then? Because no, that's, 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 that, already are just that, now. that's not the case at all. The, <coughs> uh, sorry, I'll move you on to Ross. Thanks, Commissioner. i um, touched on this already, but I'm just looking for a bit of further clarity around the provisions on consent being in the Code of Practice rather than in the legislation. What makes you confident that you've met the requirements of the Supreme Court without having put these into the legislation directly? Um, again, the, the bill and uh, the illustrative draft code of practice don't seek to change the law on consent. Um, so within the data protection uh, legislation and human rights law, there are limited circumstances right now where information can be shared without consent. So the bill is not seeking to, to create a new law around consent. What the bill um, requires um, is that, you know, where information um, is to be shared, that it can only be shared where it is in, where it is in compliance with the law. What the illustrative code of uh, what the illustrative code of practice is seeking to do um, is to respond to what the Supreme Court said about safeguards and ensure that um, you know we're not just leaving um, the the interpretation of um, the law as it stands just to. Um, you know, the interpretation of the service providers, but saying that there will be a binding um, code of practice which sets out the steps which a named person service provider or others seeking to share information with them would have to go through in order to demonstrate that they were in compliance with, with the law on data protection and therefore the law on consent. Thank you. M much of this was already covered. Yeah, okay, thanks. Professor Oliver. Um, I'd just like to take that a little bit further and just explore the decision not to put the safeguarding guidance into primary legislation. Um, it says in the um, delegated powers uh, memorandum that it was uh, sort of impractical to do that. I just wondered how far that was explored uh, before you, you kind of reached that conclusion. Um, I think, again, you know, by its very nature, primary legislation has to be precise and um, technical. The, um, the, in considering the options that um, the government might have taken going forward, um, we were very clear that um, responding to the 
concerns of the Supreme Court about safeguards and ensuring that um, clear and accessible guidance was available to practitioners undertaking these responsibilities was required. Um, and, and again, the, the intention behind providing the committee with an illustration of what that code might look like was to demonstrate um, how that, you know, that, that additional um, contextual information the, that was required in order to, to put those safeguards in place had a different nature um, to um, the provisions which are in the bill. Um, it, you know, the bill does provide for that code of practice to be binding. Um, so it's, you know, it's it's not optional. It's not, uh, you know, it's not statutory guidance that um, professionals will just have to have regard to. They will require to comply with the steps that are set out in uh, in any code of practice. Um, and and therefore, the approach that the government set out was was what we determined was the the, the best way to balance. Um, what, what we felt we were hearing from the Supreme Court in terms of providing clarity about the relationship between the Act and um, the law as it stands and providing um, detail on safeguards and the relevant law. I appreciate it may be difficult to put all of the guidance into primary legislation, but was any consideration given to a sort of hybrid in effect where some of the guiding principles or maybe enshrined in the legislation itself. I, I think. I think, uh, as I've said, you know, th these are um, you know, the the points that the Supreme Court raised were were something that we gave very careful consideration to, um, and. Um, we used the intensive three-month period to try and listen to what um, professionals and families and children and young people themselves were telling us um, that was important to them about the name person service and the getting it right for every child policy. And the, um, the approach that is before the committee is, is the approach which the government felt best addressed the concerns of the Supreme Court. Okay, and were any other... Was any other drafting work done before that decision was taken or was that a decision taken in, in principle because it was just too difficult or did you, you know, was, was it worked through in order to arrive at that conclusion? I, I think, um, you know, I, as you would expect, um, you know, we as officials, um, you know, work through um, any issues um, in, in the drafting process. That's a normal part of the you know, the drafting process before, you know, a bill is, is put before before the committee. So, so that... So whilst it was deemed uh, practically difficult to put it into the legislation, it wasn't deemed legally impossible when it was being drafted? Yeah. Um, yeah. As Alan said, um, detailed consideration was given to just exactly how to approach this. Um, and one of the issues is, for example, you know, people said, well, why don't you um, say that consent is required up front on the face of the bill? And um, clearly it would have been possible to do that. The thing is, it would, it would only have been possible to do that saying consent is required except in particular circumstances, except in certain circumstances. And you then have had to set out much in the way that, that the code does um, those particular circumstances, except you'd have to do it with the level of precision which is required of um, primary legislation. So, is, so it's okay legally for guidance to be imprecise, but primary legislation has to be, is that? Um, well, I think that's not quite what I'm saying. This specific bill here, Oliver. I mean, you're, you're now talking about drafting bills. I don't, and, I don't, think, I don't think I am. Well, I think you are. I mean, right now you're, you're now talking about how bills are drafted and, uh, as a whole. So are you suggesting that every single thing should be in the face of every bill? No, I'm, I'm talking about what specifically should be in this one. And whether or not, because this is a, I, I mean, I think uh, other committee members are about to come on to some questions around uh, how uh, this this bill sits in terms of uh, whether, whether it's akin to affirmative uh, procedure. And I'm trying to understand well, what what we decided. I, I think I've answered you about five times, but, but feel free to draw it to a conclusion. Okay, doc. Uh, can I just ask uh, one further question uh, around uh, the uh, need to, uh, to take into consideration? Uh, what Parliament says and, and what the kind of legal standing uh, of that is. What what's the requirement on the government uh, to to take into consideration what what Parliament says? What does that mean in practice? 
Well, really just what it says. I mean, if, if Parliament makes a, um, a express the view in relation to um, the um, draft code, I take it we're talking about the draft code here, yeah. then the government's required to take that into account in providing, in producing um, a final version of the code. So what, what, what does take it into account mean in practice? Do they have to listen to it or they just have to take the information on board? They don't, there's no requirement to take any action as a result of concerns? Um, there's no legal duty? Well, the legal duty is to take it into account so um, that if the government failed to take it into account, then it would have failed in that legal duty. So that, would must that would have to be challenged in the courts. It couldn't be challenged in the parliament itself. Well, I mean, all is it just subject to parliamentary debate? All law is ultimately subject to um, interpretation by the courts and to enforcement by the courts. Um, so, you know, it's no different to any other law in that respect. So, just going back, to, if, I, if I may, just going back to the point you were making about um, the code of practice, you mentioned guidance. It's, it's not guidance that would be um, issued under section 26B and 40B. It's, it's a code of practice. Um, and the, um, the Supreme Court, in um, paragraph 107 of its judgment, does recommend that as one of the possible ways in which to address this matter. And it also, in an earlier um, paragraph of its judgment, um, refers with approval to a, to a code of practice issued in relation to policing. Um, and you, I think it's fair to say that consideration by the Supreme Court did influence our thinking. Thank you. OK, thanks, Oliver. And Joanne? Yeah, I was wanting to talk, to continue the question around this whole question of the code of practice. Um, you talk about an illustrative code of practice. This is something that's ever been done in legislation in the Parliament before. Um, not to my understanding. I, th um, I think um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, John, that um, there have been instances where um, during the parliamentary process, um, drafts of um, subordinate legislation, which um, bills are providing um, powers um, to produce, the early drafts of those have been of have been provided for um, the Parliament for their assistance. Um, I think, um, you know, the, the reason that um, Mr Swinney and has taken the, the decision um, to provide an illustration at, at, at this time is in recognition of the significant interest that there has been in these matters. So what's an illustration of? It is an illustration of, of how the power that um, the, the <coughs> bill um, sets out in relation to the provision of a code of practice could be used. Um, it's, but it but it's important to recognise that should the Parliament approve um, the provision in the bill that, um, that, 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 that places ministers under the obligation to issue a code of practice, that the, that the procedure um, that, that is set out in the bill would have to be complied with. So it is not intended to be um, the code of practice which would be, be in place when, when, when so the these provisions are implemented. So the very different from an illustration that's giving us no real indication of what that code, or no guarantee of what that code of practice could look like? Well, I, I think, you know, we can't presume, um, you know, how, what the parliamentary consideration of this bill is going to be at this stage. But would you accept, technically, that our view of the bill will in large part be shaped by our capacity to deliver and the intent of the bill through the code of practice, and that there's therefore a gap between us, look at what, what seems to be said is you can look at the legislation, to agree the legislation, there will then be a code of practice, which may not be like the illustrative code of practice, but the code of practice itself, the same scrutiny will not apply to that as to le the legislation which delivers the requirement to have the code of practice. Um, the in th this this process that we're engaged in right now is the scrutiny of the bill in in the in the normal way that that legislation is scrutinised by the Parliament. But, but it's 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 not our um, submission that the illustrative code of practice um, is required in order for the the Parliament to 
to pass would it be in its view. Would it be reasonable for the Parliament to expect that the core bit of this legislation, which is the delivery of the Code of Practice, should have the same scrutiny by the Parliament as the legislation itself? I'm not sure why... I may be missing something technically here, but it feels to me the Parliament has been asked to confirm that we require the Code of Practice, but the Code of Practice itself could be something very different from this illustration, but we will not have the same capacity to scrutinise that as the bit of legislation that's insisted the Code of Practice is to come into being. Do you see that there's an issue there in terms of scrutiny and indeed building confidence around the outcomes from the Bill itself? It, it will obviously be for, for, for members to um, you know, express their views in relation to the proposal that the government has has put forward. Um, the proposal that is in the bill is that a, you know a binding code of practice would require to be um, published by um, ministers, and that um, and a, a procedure that required consultation, and that draft code of practice be laid in front of Parliament would apply to that. But, you know, but obviously we, we are in a process right now where the, the provisions of the bill are accept, being scrutinised. Do you accept, like say for example, I completely accept, for sake of argument, there should be a code of practice. If the code of practice that comes out at the end of the process is one with which I've got some concerns in terms of the ability to deliver in the intent of the bill, I haven't got the same place to scrutinise this committee, more importantly, hasn't got the opportunity to scrutinise that, as we have agreeing that the, the requirement should be there. Do you not think that there should be some clarity around the part, given particularly the contention around the bill, there should be, was there even consideration given to how you could build into the process full parliament, as full parliamentary scrutiny of the code of practice as of the bill itself? Uh, you know, as I've previously said, you know, we, we are in a process of, of scrutiny right now. Um, but the, with respect, the, we're scrutinising the illustrative code of practice, not the code of no, practice. No, no, I meant that we're in a process of scrutinising the power. Here, yeah. the, this uh, illustrative code of practice, if you weren't giving us this illustrative code of practice just now, what would you have been giving us in, in its place? Well, I, you know, the, the decision that the, the Deputy First Minister took was that to provide the committee and the public with an illustration yeah. of, code of, of Code of Practice but, but, on yeah. the basis that that would be of assistance. You know, yeah. I, I can't... Um, that no, that was no, the decision I, I, that he I, took and what he felt would be I most accept helpful. That, but what I'm trying to get is that if that decision hadn't been made, what normally would come to us about the Code of Practice at this stage? Just that we were going to have one? Uh, well, you, well, as um, as would normally be the case, of course there would be discussion and information about how how the the, the government intended to use the powers that you know the bill before it were um, were, were were placing on ministers. Um, the you know, given the the nature of this bill, the deputy first minister took the decision that it would be of assistance to. Um, the committee and uh, the public in general to to be able to see what a code of practice might look like, and and you know obviously that um, you know will also be of assistance to us as Scottish government officials because you know we're hopeful that the discussion um, that takes place through this parliamentary process, um, assuming that at the end of this process the parliament confers that responsibility on ministers to issue a code, a code of practice, that the, that the discussion and debate around the, the illustrative draft that's before you will, will help us ensure that a draft that is later consulted on has al already been cognizant of the views that have been shared. So can, can, just let me clarify one other point then on this uh, illustrative code of practice. If we are having a look at it and we think there's you know, two or three things wrong with it, we don't like the way it is, and we feed that in, do you think that would get fed back to what the code of practice would eventually look like? Well, you know... I I know you can't speak as, for the think, and that's, a, that, that's an unfair Yeah, question. and again, that's a, that's I would question. just underline the, the point I made point. earlier that we, you know, we cannot, as the government, presume um, uh, the powers that the Parliament are going to, or, or the duties that the, the Parliament are going to confer on ministers. 
as I've said, um, the Deputy First Minister took the view that sharing an illustration of, of how the power that is set out in the bill that sharing an illustration of how that could be used would be of benefit to uh, the parliamentary consideration of the bill and then assuming that um, that, that the provision that we're talking about um, is, uh, is approved by the Parliament, the procedure that is set out in the bill would have to be complied with. So, you know, there will be a full and proper consultation of um, the relevant persons affected. There will be a requirement to lay a draft of the Code of Practice um, in front of the Parliament for 40 days, and then there will be a, a duty on ministers uh, to consider any views that the Parliament has expressed. OK, thank you. Oliver, and then back to John. Uh, can I just ask, I'm sort of slightly struggling to follow that. Um, is it correct to say the bill as introduced could have been introduced just the same without any amendments whatsoever and no illustrative code of practice provided? The legislation? I'm not sure I understand your question well, in relation to could it have been submitted well, without in, amendment? Well, as in could it, as is at the moment, as introduced? Yes, yeah, yes. So. Uh, you know, the, the normal... Um, so process could, would be that a bill was laid before to, without without any you know supporting materials in terms of illustrations of how subordinate powers might in, be used. In this in this specific case, the legislation would remain exactly the same, whether or not the code was there or not. Yes, so, so the provisions of the bill are not affected by the illustrative code of practice that has been so provided got, for got, you. Sorry, it, it's it, got no legal sort of standing in terms of the bill. What's the illustration doesn't. The you know if if the 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 um, powers that are or or the duties mm -hmm. that are set out in the bill are duly conferred on ministers, there will be a requirement on them to issue a so binding code of practice. Listen, this listen I want to draw this. I want to draw this to a close a because this, no, 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 no. The, we we wrote to the cabinet secretary about this, and he, and he got back to us and he said that he was. He was having this illustrative draft code of practice to accompany the bill, just to show us how it could possibly look when when it was how the powers could possibly be be operated once it was on practice. And I, th I mean, I think we're getting caught on something that was meant to be helpful if we find it or not. Uh, when there's probably more important issues to get uh, to discuss around about the bill, can can we move on and go back to Joanne? Please yeah. don't go back to the code of practice. No, 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 no. Uh, I won't. That's something we can raise with the cabinet yeah, secretary himself. I wonder, just a couple of uh, final points. Has there been a change in the in the policy intention um, of this area of work, given that we're now seeing? Because it, it feels as it's a very long way from the real world. So the real world is not just about families who are seeking help. There are families who resist seeking help, and children are vulnerable. Does the legislation still address that question? Secondly. The problem where there would be large numbers of, we know the stories ourselves, of large people engaged in a, a child's life, and the information wasn't shared, or the story wasn't told, and the child suffered as a consequence, and, and often with tragic consequences. If we're in a position where there is no duty to share information, you, you still think to tell me what it would look like if somebody can prove that they've considered sharing information, that we're in a place still where if people don't share information, if they don't go back and say, we noticed this, we noticed that, we're still in the same place that we are with every tra tragic case. And how are we going to address that if it's not going to be a duty to share, which I think the government in policy terms has moved back from? Um, how are we addressing that question that is really what's prompted all the legislation, in my view? Vulnerable children being let down by a system that hasn't noticed the signs of vulnerability. How are you... How, is this legislation going to help that? Um, or how is it going to address that policy? I'm, I'm right in saying the policy intent has had to change. The, the, the pol so, uh, uh, and again, I would refer to the previous statements that the Deputy First Minister has made in this regard, that the policy in relation to the Getting It Right for Every Child approach, the named uh, person service and child's plans has not changed. Um, that policy um, uh, and... Uh, you know, the aims of the 2014 Act um, were determined by the Supreme Court to be legitimate and benign. 
what the Supreme Court have required the government to consider again is um, how the information sharing provisions operate and how um, we can provide clarity to ensure that information sharing um, happens in compliance with the law. Um, it's, it's absolutely uh, the intention of uh, the named person service that it seeks to improve uh, the position that we are in right now. And as you have identified the issues that we have heard many times before about um, different services um, holding um, bits of information that, that, you know, if they had been seen together, could have told us an important story. Um, that's why... Um, uh, the, the requirements in the 2014 Act for the provision of, of a universal service hasn't changed. It is, it is um, the policy intention of the government that um, a, a, a named person service is available um, for um, all children and, and young people in, in Scotland. Um, there's obviously that exception in relation to children in, in the armed forces. Um, and and the, the, the provisions that are set out in, in the bill, um, I think, in, ensure for professionals working within that service that they... That they that they, they understand and have clarity about the responsibilities that are being placed on them, that they have, you know, the bill um, will the fir for the first time place a duty on all named person service providers to be having regard to the well-being needs of children and, and you know, the, the, uh, the care inspector evidence that I think has been submitted to the committee highlights that whilst good progress has been made over a number of years that there are still there are still gaps and there are still issues. Um, so, so the bill will place that duty, and that you know that is a duty that. Um, what uh, but what evidence do they have to show that they've considered it? Uh, that we've considered. You're saying that rather than some have a duty to share information, they have a duty to consider sharing. What evidence do they have to? I mean, because otherwise it doesn't feel very different from uh, good practice currently. They require um, to provide. Uh -huh. Um, well, again, you know, the, the illustrative draft code of practice that's before you um, includes um, a requirement that um, professionals would have to record their decision making. Now, that, 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 that is a requirement of good decision making already, but will ensure that, you know, through the binding nature of that code of practice, that, um, that the, the name person service so and approach record, in relation to child to, plans. They have to record that they decided not to share information. Yes, they will They will be required to do that. So the last point I want to ask is, is a, this maybe a, I'm missing this completely, but what consideration has been given of the impact of the change in governance for schools um, on the responsibility of a local authority towards um, a children and their named person? Because you go through the list of who's responsible at different ages and stages, and what it says is the local authority is the responsibility, but you will accept that through the government pro governance proposals, a lot of the powers of local government over schools is changing, and has that been factored into the legislation? Um, w at, at, at an official level, that's obviously the level that I can uh, represent today, we are um, working very closely with our colleagues who have responsibility for delivering the government's policy objectives on school governance. It, you know, the, the bill um, doesn't, and, and the 2014 Act doesn't change the responsibilities of local authorities, and it is still, um, it will still be the case that the, the the, the duty to provide the name, uh, the named person service, will rest at local authority level. Despite the fact that there are more powers going and, and autonomy to the head teachers within individual schools, has but, there been has there been some consideration of actually shifting that responsibility to to schools and to head teachers, or has, it, has has there been a conversation about whether it would be a good idea or not? We, as officials, have been having discussions around the impact, as, as you would expect us to do, about the impact of our respective policies on each other, but the, the government's policy intention has not changed. This is clearly an issue that uh, Joanne will be raising with the Cabinet Secretary yes. when he comes here in a couple thank of weeks. Yes, okay. yes, thank right. you. Is that it, Thank you very much. Uh, and Oh, sorry, Liz, my apologies. The question about the financial uh, memorandum and... Uh
you, you referred to that earlier when you said that obviously the, there has to be a satisfaction that there is sufficient resources and money available to ensure that those who are delivering the name person service uh, are professionally competent. Uh, could, could I ask about what plans you have for that on an ongoing basis in terms of the costs that you see accruing uh, as a result of this policy? Um, as I understand it, those professionals are now going to be in a position of having to make a judgment about whether to share information rather than having a duty of requirement put upon them. And therefore, that means that to make that judgment, uh, I believe that they have to have uh, a knowledge of the law and they will have to be very um, competent when it comes to weighing up uh, the merits under the wellbeing concern of whether to share that information or not. That's quite substantial training, I would have thought, given that people are very busy and not necessarily trained as uh, lawyers. What financial consideration has been given to this training? Um, so, I, as, I, as I said in my opening statement, um, 10.2 million has already been invested in, in uh, supporting um, those that will have responsibilities for the name person service ready themselves for impl implementation. And um, uh, again, as I said, um, those uh, organisations had confirmed with the government ahead of 2000, uh, August 2016 that they were ready to be compliant with the law as it was under the 2014 Act. Um, as I've set out today, the, the, the bill makes changes in relation to information sharing only. Um, it, it, it clarifies the relationship between what would be an amended 2014 Act and the current law on data sharing, human rights and the law of confidentiality. Um, we have, uh, on, the, on the basis, um, using the similar modelling um, that was used during the progress of the 2014 Act, um, the government has identified a further 1.2 million, which will be invested um, in the year 2018-19 um, to develop um, that training um, and to ensure that it becomes embedded within um, the, the normal um, CPD and supervision requirements that um, persons taking on these new responsibilities will, will already undertake. So our expectation um, is that it will be a, a one-off investment and that then that, 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 that training will become part of the, the regular and ordinary professional development and supervision. So, sorry, can I just clarify, why would it be a one-off uh, investment given that obviously new named persons would require to have ongoing training? Well, that, you know, that's that's the, the case in relation to, you know, how, um, you know, services deal with a turnover of their staff now. The, the additional funds that are being invested are to ensure that the, 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 the training methodology and the, the practice materials that will be required to support that training um, are, are in place. So, is, is there no financial predictions for the ongoing costs beyond... 2018-19 uh, with the additional 1.2 million? Um, as I've said, we've, we've um, utilised the same methodology that was applied for the 2014 Act um, and um, we'll be putting in place um, the um, finances that are required to ensure that you know that 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 training and that backfill can um, can be made in 2018-19 but as the financial memorandum sets out the expectation is that that will be um, a, a, a one-off investment with that um, training becoming part of the normal um, professional development supervision requirements that these professionals engage with already thank you very much Okay. Uh, in that case, can I draw this session to close and thank Ms. Burton and Mr. Patterson for their attendance and forbearance. Uh, we now move into private session and allow a few minutes for the witnesses in the gallery to leave and we'll also have a five-minute break. <laughs>